Hey guys, uh, thanks for coming to my session. Um, uh, my name is Sean Prezabilla. I'm a solutions architect uh, for AWS. I specifically focus on media and entertainment applications uh, on our platform, uh, and I work with a lot of our, our big media customers. And uh, one of the topics that comes up over and over again for us, especially in the last couple of years, is immersive streaming, VR, augmented reality. And so what I wanted to do is, um, you know, in the spirit of a, the, the builder culture we have at AWS, um, is, is um, walk you through kind of something we've built and then provide you with some resources uh, to take away uh, after today. And maybe, you know, on the flight home or in the hotel room, you can, you can spin this up for yourself. Um, so before we get started, uh, just a quick, Quick note, we only have 20 minutes. I'll be here afterwards. I'll be at lunch. If you have questions, come find me. We can chat afterwards. Quick agenda. Uh, we're going to quickly touch on the landscape, because I think one of the things that comes up a lot is uh, a lot of confusion around some of the terminology and some of the applications. And I just want to get that out of the way. And then we'll get into 360 degree live streaming, and then the reference architecture uh, that we provided, um, as well as some other information. So let's get into it. Uh, so immersive experiences. Um, the way I kind of view this is, 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 is on, a, on a chart like this where there's existing experiences that we all know and love, uh, like streaming media is two-dimensional fixed flat video. Oh, we're sending it to our iPhones, our iPads, uh, et cetera. Uh, but there's been an explosion over the last two, three, four years um, with the advent of head mount displays as well as uh, uh, dis um, using your mobile phone as a head mount display. Um, so I've kind of displayed these out on, on kind of a, a, an XY chart here. And on the bottom you can see we have immersive experiences with uh, devices like the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift. We have augmented reality experiences with uh, Microsoft HoloLens or now with uh, Apple's AR kit using your I iPad. You can you know, render three-dimensional objects in, in a space that you're, you're, you're physically in. Um, and 360 video, I think most of us are probably familiar with Facebook Live or YouTube Live, um, and, and, and potentially viewing content in 360 uh, on, on either our, our desktop computers, our mobile devices, basically scrolling around, seeing a 360 degree plane, uh, et cetera. And the reason uh, I think 360 degree video is important because, is because it's so widely accessible. Um, so for, 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 for the most part, um, folks uh, uh, have access to 360 degree video uh, through by, by, by virtue of owning a mobile phone or having a desktop computer, uh, but they don't have access to HoloLens or the HTC Vive unless they want to spend a significant sum of money. And so I think 360 degree video is important uh, because it's going to be the first experience that a lot of people have with a new uh, medium entirely, an extended reality medium or an immersive experience. Um, so where are we seeing this? Pretty much everywhere. I mean, if you've, uh, if you've looked at the New York Times lately, they have New York Times VR. Um, there was an image in the previous slide. They, they, they basically sent a Google Cardboard so you could turn your, your mobile device into a, a head mount display. Um, there's also some applications in sports. Uh, Next VR, I think, worked with the NBA to do 360-degree live streaming of, uh, of, of a basketball game. Uh, but then there's some other kind of industries outside of the publishing and media and entertainment space that might not be m immediately obvious. Um, so, for instance, real estate and architecture. Um, real estate, uh, to, if you're selling a, a high-value house, it might be valuable to, say, take 360-degree images in every room and, and provide those images or even a live stream during an open house to people who can't physically be at that open house. Um, and I think... I'm most excited about the, the kind of the, the experiences that we haven't really thought of, and that's kind of what inspired me to build this, is to provide you guys with a reference architecture so that you can go off and build something really cool that none of us have thought of yet. Uh, so with that, let's get into how we, how we build something like this. Um, so we're at Streaming Media West. I think a lot of us are familiar with how live streaming systems work, so I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, but in, in general, live streaming of a 360 degree immersive experience is not much different from a distribution perspective, but there are some key considerations um, to keep in mind for, uh, for, for uh, a successful live stream of 360. Uh, so th there's a couple stages. Uh, you're capturing and distributing or contrib contributing uh, a source feed to a pro your processing infrastructure and then delivering it uh, over a, a tra traditional CDN. 
which is pretty straightforward. I think a lot of us are probably familiar with this, you know, capture stream process to ABR, deliver over a traditional CDN or origin uh, to, to our end users. Um, so generally, the capturing is going to be happening at a local event, not on AWS. So one of the key considerations is, you know, how do we get from the capture location to, to the cloud? And I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, but first, uh, there's a wide variety of cameras uh, to capture content. And so I just wanted to call out that there's a, a wide range of potential devices and potential uh, uh, arrays of cameras you could use to capture this content. And all of them have uh, varying features. Some things to keep in mind um, that, that drastically affect the architecture from a distribution perspective would be uh, whether it's monoscopic or stereoscopic. Um, there's some really large considerations there. Um, whether the device has onboard stitching capabilities or whether it has onboard encoding capabilities is a big one. Um, how fast the device uh, drains its battery or does it have onboard storage if you're, if you're doing like video on demand recording? Those are all key considerations. And you can spend as little as $300. Uh, I forgot to bring it up, but I have like a little camera that attaches to my cell phone that does 360 degree live streaming, all the way to you know, $50,000 plus for custom camera arrays that you build yourself with, uh, with uh, uh, um, GoPros or, or, or other devices. Um, one of the other um, considerations is your stitching and projection mapping. Um, the most common approach is equirectangular, um, but and you can think of equirectangular uh, projection mapping as kind of like uh, our traditional map, all right? It's not a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison. There's distortion at the, at the poles of, of, a, of a map of, of the Earth. Um, and when we go to project that inside of a sphere, um, there's a lot of waste that happens. For instance, by the way, the alien's supposed to be your head. So imagine your head's inside a sphere and we're projecting the video inside of it, um, sort of like a, a planetarium or something like that. And there's some problems with equirectangular. So you notice there's a lot of defor deformation as you go further and further um, from, um, from the middle. And then there's like a, a lot of wasted data at the poles. Um, so you're not utilizing the sphere very well. Um, so there's a couple of other approaches that have been pioneered by folks at Facebook and YouTube, um, uh, specifically cube map, pyramid mapping, and barrel mapping. And all these mapping technologies have various trade-offs, and, and they're we're really trying to figure out uh, what the best approach is that takes into consideration th the whole distribution chain. For instance, uh, pyramid mapping, I think uh, Facebook has a great blog post on. Um, they, uh, they were discussing how you could do uh, view adaptive bit rate, where the bit, uh, the bit rate of the angles where the user isn't looking are delivered at a lower bit rate than the, than the viewport that they're actually viewing the content in, and that changes in real time as the user changes their head in that plane. Um, that's not necessarily supported natively in some of the adaptive bitrate protocols, as you might imagine, but uh, I'm hopeful that um, some of these key learnings will be folded into those standards over time. Uh, there's another consideration. A lot of those cameras say they're 4K, but the reality is they're a 4K capture of a 360-degree experience. What the user actually sees is not 4K. They're seeing whatever they're looking at in that experience. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, as you think about, you know, contribution, capture, you know, 4K in a two-dimensional fixed plane uh, experience is, is, is much diff different than, than sending video for a full three, 360 immersive experience. Um, so how do we get it to our processing infrastructure? Uh, there's been a couple of great talks, uh, and there's an upcoming one, I think, tomorrow on SRT uh, about this problem, so I won't go into it too much here. Uh, but the gist is there's a lot of protocols and it depends on your infrastructure. <laughs> um, I think from an educational perspective, RTMP is a great way to get started. That's what our reference architecture uses. Uh, it has some nice properties in, this, in the sense that it's integrated with a lot of, tool, uh, a lot of free and open source software. Um, but it has some downsides in the sense that like, it's no longer supported and isn't going to continue to be supported by Adobe. Um, so once we get it to the cloud, there are a few options for processing. Uh, we can use AWS Elemental to transcode with Elemental Live. Uh, for video on demand, we can use Elastic Transcoder. There's plenty of options in the AWS marketplace um, for encoding and distribution, products like Wowza and, and Bitmovin and things like that. Or we can build it ourselves using traditional EC2 uh, infrastructure. Um, so there's a whole plethora of options here. 
Uh, and then for delivery, um, I, I sort of touched on this in, 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 in mentioning uh, cube mapping, um, or I'm sorry, the, the pyramid mapping, but when you're delivering 4K and the user is only seeing like you know 720p, the the, the resolution scales are much larger than just your traditional flat fixed video. So you need a lot more bits to deliver a, a compelling experience to the end user. Uh, and that has massive ramifications on the bandwidth costs to deliver, say, OTT streams of 360 degree video uh, to end users. Um, and so I, I, there's been some work done uh, to explore, uh, for instance, 180 degree streaming to say, you know, cut down on a lot of the costs of, of, of delivering immersive streaming solutions. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, adaptive, view dependent adaptive streaming is, is a term that, that's popping up as well. So, uh, you know, basically context aware of, of where the user's looking, uh, spinning up the bit rate there and, and lowering the bit rate where they're not actually perceiving much quality benefit. Um, and th there's a couple of different ways, you, there's, there's a bunch of different ways you can render 360 degree video. Um, there's a lot of open source players out there uh, and open source uh, software. There's also a bunch of commercial software, uh, uh, so uh, commercial players that support it. Uh, in, in, in the reference architecture, I've chosen to use uh, Mozilla A-Frame and HLS-JS simply because uh, I have aspirations to move this to more of a VR experience in time. For instance, um, Mozilla A-Frame is not just a, a video player. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a web VR based uh, declarative framework for defining three dimensional objects in the web browser. But one of the things that's really cool about it is you can simply render a video sphere and then just project HLS streams into that video sphere really easily. Um, the other thing that it comes with basically out of the box is a, a head mount display support. Um, so you can basically, you can use it in a browser. That's kind of the, the workshop and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the reference architecture. Uh, but you could also uh, simply click to uh, launch in a head mount display as well. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see more kind of immersive video experiences taking advantage of controller support, native head mount display support and things like that. And I think uh, A-Frame is a pretty cool tool to enable that. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, so the reference arch architecture um, is pretty complex. Um, the goal here is to teach people how live streaming works as well as bring uh, you know, immersive streaming to, to those who are kind of uh, setting out to build uh, live streaming solutions. Um, and uh, yeah, I, if you're interested in the reference architecture, uh, on GitHub, we have uh, um, the reference architecture as well as uh, the work and project um, workshop that we're doing at reInvent, which is um, November 27th. Um, there's a whole media and entertainment industry day on Monday. That's when I'm doing a workshop on how you actually build this. But like I said, uh, if you're not attending reInvent, um, all of the code for the workshop as well as the code for the reference architecture as well as a uh, a blog post will be coming out soon for, for actually building the infrastructure. Thanks. All right, round of applause. Sean. <laughs> well, Sean, we have a few minutes. Do you want to see if they have any questions? Sure. I know you know, all know everything there is to know about streaming 360 video now, but just in case you still have a question, um, Sean is here. We have an expert. Anybody? Anybody? Uh, did I see a hand? Oh, someone over here, you're pointing. All right, we have one. What about PS View support? Yeah, what about PS View support? Uh, PS, oh, the, uh, the PlayStation headset? Um, I'm not sure if A-Frame supports that natively, but I know that the PlayStation console has a web browser. Um, and the nice thing about A-Frame and doing the VR experience in a native browser is that if the browser supports um, uh, the, the, the primitives necessary for those libraries, it, will, it should work in that display. I don't know that uh, PlayStation supports uh, the requirements for A-Frame today though. I, I didn't see it on, on their list of, of, of compatible devices, uh, but that, I imagine that it's a, it's a browser limitation probably on the PlayStation uh, device itself. Uh, but you could also implement um, you know, a, a native player uh, in, in, um, 
in another uh, framework outside of the browser, right? There's possibilities there as well. All right, we have frequent questioner Fred right here. All right, take it away. Uh, do you uh, support uh, WebRTC as a uh, way to reduce latency? Uh, so this architecture does not implement WebRTC. Um, uh, this, um, I would like to restate that the, um, the goal of this architecture is to simply educate people on how they can implement live streaming and, and 360 degree experiences on, on AWS. So, um, uh, but there's no reason you couldn't say implement WebRTC as part of this. The, the code is open source, the project is open sourced. If you want to take this for a spin, fork it, submit a pull request that implements R, R, uh, WebRTC, that'd be great. Um, it does primarily rely on open source technologies um, like FFmpeg and, and, and Nginx. So uh, I don't know exactly the implementation de details that would be required for WebRTC. Okay, we have another one here. Give me your name and your question. Stavros, um, have you or will you be doing any objective measures on, on latency requirements? Obviously it has to be low, but where does it break? Where does it start affecting quality? Um, <laughs> So I, I've done some initial latency tests on this. Um, it's, there's, as part of the workshop, one of, the, one of the, uh, the ideas is to have participants help lower latency by adjusting segment size and tuning. Um, but latency hasn't been a, a key focus for this. I mean, uh, I think latency is, is definitely important in certain applications, um, but as one of the things that I, I always come back to is like, if the event or the live stream isn't simulcast on a traditional network, then latency doesn't matter if it's you know, 10 seconds or five seconds and viewers can't see it anywhere else, so it's not a big deal. So if I'm only, if I'm you know, uh, building this uh, system compared to uh, you know, Facebook Live or Periscope or something like that for people to stream you know, cat videos 24 by, se by seven, latency doesn't really matter because that's the only place I'm distributing the, this content. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying no. Cat videos, 24-7. <laughs> That's what I'm going to take away from this. Anybody, last question? No? Okay, well, we are going to get to our drawing.